you need to actually store all that state somewhere. And for a billion users, it's actually going to be a lot of state. And this is, usually everybody talk, you know, talks about TPS, but actually one of the bigger bottlenecks right now across the space is state. And so obviously no, no single computer, no single kind of node can process all that, can validate the whole network. Now you can rotate these validators, validate what chart all the time, every block. They can be actually, you know, you can randomly select a set of validators and they are able to validate this because they don't need to sync into the shard. They don't need to process every single transaction that ever hit that shard. They only need to look at this specific block. So data availability and consensus are merged together into a single single mechanic. The essence of it is you you want to have a design that is not dependent on the underlying hardware itself improving at a certain rate to be able to service user demands. You want to have mechanisms beyond that type of scaling. This episode is brought to you by Gnosis. Gnosis builds decentralized infrastructure for the Ethereum ecosystem. With a rich history dating back to 2015 and products like Safe, CowSwap, or Gnosis Chain, Gnosis combines needs-driven development with deep technical expertise. This year marks the launch of Gnosis Pay, the world's first decentralized payment network. With a Gnosis card, you can spend self-custody crypto at any visa-accepting merchant around the world. If you're an individual looking to live more on-chain or a business looking to white-label the stack, visit GnosisPay.com. There are lots of ways you can join the Gnosis journey. Drop in the Gnosis DAO governance form, become a Gnosis validator with a single GNO token and low-cost hardware, or deploy your product on the EVM-compatible and highly decentralized Gnosis chain. Get started today at Gnosis.io. Cars One is one of the biggest node operators globally and help you stake your tokens on 45 plus networks like Ethereum, Cosmos, Celestia and DYDX. More than 100,000 delegators stake with Chorus One, including institutions like BitGo and Ledger. Staking with Chorus One not only gets you the highest yields, but also the most robust security practices and infrastructure that are usually exclusive for institutions. You can stake directly to Chorus One's public node from your wallet, set up a white label node, or use the recently launched product, Opus, to stake up to 8,000 ETH in a single transaction. You can even offer high yield staking to your own customers using their API. Your assets always remain in your custody, so you can have complete peace of mind. Start staking today at Chorus.one. Hello everyone, welcome to Epicenter. Today I have an amazing episode lined up for you. We're talking to Alex and Ilya, the co-founders of Near, which is a in-production sharded blockchain with a lot of value riding on it. Uh, specifically, we will cover how near sharding actually works, try to build it concept by concept into an integrated whole, and then understand where they are in their journey to implement sharding. Alex and Ilya, welcome to Epicenter. So at this point, we've kind of done a few episodes with both of you. Uh, maybe you could give you know a short introduction to your to your backgrounds. Hi, yeah, I think at this point my background is uh, all near. Everything that was before is irrelevant, but uh, yeah, I, I was working on a sharded database called MemSQL before Near for five years, uh, which is right now, it's an in-production sharded database. Uh, and uh, yeah, and before that, I was at Microsoft. Yeah, I mean, my background is actually in machine learning AI. Uh, I was at Google Research prior to our startup adventures, and uh, I was... Uh, one of the costs I was in a paper that introduced transformers, which is technology powering ChatGPT, Midjourney, and other AI advancements. And then with Alex, we actually started originally near as an AI company and uh, realized we need fast, cheap, easy to use, easy to build on blockchain because we wanted to uh, use it ourselves for uh, data crowdsourcing and some other data use cases for our AI company and end up pivoting to that in 2018 and uh, yeah, focusing on that ever since. 
yeah let's get into sharding um blockchain scalability so what is sharding overall and why has it been a generally difficult target industry wide i think i mean maybe broad, broader question is if if we imagine having a billion users coming in and using blockchain as a means of payments, as a means of tracking ownership, as a way to kind of coordinate resources and efforts. Uh, you imagine that you need to have kind of a few things happening, right? One is you need to actually store all that state somewhere. And for a billion users, it's actually going to be a lot of state. And this is usually everybody talk, you know, talks about TPS, but actually one of the bigger bottlenecks right now across the space is state uh, and kind of its growth. And so, so that's probably problem number one. Problem number two is, I mean, you have billion users, right? They transacting. There's, you know, hundreds of thousands of applications. Obviously, there's a lot of uh, kind of transactions flying around, and and uh, a lot of processing that needs to happen. And kind of people want to put more and more complex smart contracts and complex logic into this. So you need to have throughput, bandwidth, and processing power to do this. And so obviously no, no single computer, no single kind of node can process all that, can validate the whole network. And so the way to support this is one way or another, partition this computation, partition this storage, and partition this kind of bandwidth to receive this. And so people have kind of historically been talking about sharding because that's how the two companies so Alex mentioned, you know, doing this uh, kind of in Web2 world, uh, MemSQL single store now is used by Fortune 500 companies, you know, Google and Facebook have their own solutions. And it kind of seemed reasonable that this is an approach that you should take in blockchain. Now, there are a lot of kind of problems that arise when you actually move into a permissionless setup uh, kind of compared to a permission setup that usually Web2 companies deal with. I also want to add, Ilya said it's obvious that you need to share per uh, processing. I don't think it was obvious to everybody until recently. So there were multiple blockchains which were, uh, like the favorite thing they were, they like to say was like, look look at Visa, uh, look at how many transactions Visa processes, and that's a world scale. Obviously, we can do it on a single computer. Right, but as a user, you don't use Visa frequently, right? You use it like three times a day on a good day, right? And so finally now, generally when Nier launched, we made multiple bets, which were not obvious to everybody. You know, like on Nier from day one, we had uh, named accounts where you can rotate keys uh, and, and we had sharding and it wasn't obvious to everybody that it's useful. And now suddenly very scalable blockchains, which are not sharded get, uh, you know, uh, congested. And they have no way of uh, getting any more uh, performant, right? And uh, and similarly, like you know, when it comes to uh, account abstraction, like Ethereum right now is uh, switching to to that. So so now finally, it is becoming obvious to everybody that those were correct decisions. Yeah, I mean to give an example, right? Like a any any kind of a single, I call it single node blockchain, right? Which is something that. Every single node in the network needs to process every single transaction and store all the state, right? What it means is as soon as, like, let's say the network has a high capacity, they also have a huge state growth. They have kind of limit on how many transactions they can process because of the bandwidth and execution. And so at some point, there will be more demand. Like if, if and this is a very natural thing, right? The price for the transaction is usually based on supply demand. And so... While transactions are cheap, they'll, you know, at some point there will be more demand because they're so cheap to even just spam, spam it to try to get some financial uh, benefit from because the transaction fees are so cheap. And so when that happens, right, you don't have a way to expand capacity. So your, net, your prices start to grow for everyone, right? And so, so this leads to now you kind of pricing out people who were using this blockchain originally for normal use cases because of the spam and kind of people trying to run arbitrage for some other application. And so that's kind of the, just the, the principle where like any single like kind of state machine, right? Single thing machine will get overrun and, and start rising fees. 
Right. So, kind of Solana is the you know, contrasting example. Of course, even Ethereum and Bitcoin are based on the idea that the miners or the validators and even the full nodes of these systems have to process every transaction uh, that is happening in the system. Solana has taken that idea and said, yes, um, we have a bunch of validators, I think 1800 or something like that currently. And every transaction that goes through the Solana system has to be processed by every one of these validators. They are assuming that, okay, these validators can be placed in data centers where um, networking bandwidth is very high, which means a lot. they can ingest a lot of transactions from the network uh, at a very high rate. They also assume that the machines are very performant, so the work of accounting can be, um, e you can assume that each machine can handle lots of uh, transactions, uh, do, do, their, their, do their accounting work, and then Solana would al also assume that, okay, maybe the history doesn't need to be stored by these machines, they only need to store the currently what are the different accounts and what what balances they own, and what they they kind of like a project like Solana assumes is the improvement in in compute in terms of like bandwidth processing power, and every resource is it kind of doubles on some time scale. So some resources double on a twelve month time scale, another one doubt might double on three year time scale, but because of this doubling the capacity of the blockchain would keep growing at a certain rate. And the hope is that the user growth is actually slower than the doubling rate of the underlying hardware. And therefore you continue to have like a cheap blockchain. Whereas in the near case, like near is the opposite approach where we, where you say user growth can be way faster than the improvement in hardware. So, Fundamentally, you need to move away from the paradigm of every validator or every node needing to store, first of all, what are the balances of every account in the system are. And then you also need to, so basically no single machine may have a complete view on what the balances of every account on the near system is. And then uh, it might also be the case that there's some machine and there's some transaction on the network and that transaction happened, but this machine is part of is 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 part of part of processing that network, but it never actually executed the transaction itself. And so the essence of it is you you want to have a design that is not dependent on the underlying hardware itself improving at a certain rate to be able to service user demands. You want to have mechanisms beyond that type of scaling. Yeah, I, I would add that, as I said, it, it's not even about users. It's it's actually, and in, in in a way, it's sadly the economics. The economics of this blockchain is in such that you need to have kind of a way to expand capacity. Otherwise, if you want to maintain low fees. Because at 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 some like at some level there will be a such like saturation where some subset of people are willing to pay higher fees because they need planning like they try to capture some economic value from an exchange token launch whatever trading and that in turn pr in, increases price for everybody else right and so so Solana and, and some other like kind of high capacity networks even though the idea that like, hey, we, we have enough capacity and it will grow over time. The reality of what happens is instead it gets flooded by transactions that are all trying to hit uh, kind of the same economic opportunity and extract the value. And so that people are willing to pay way higher fees than uh, folks that are uh, potentially using it for, you know, other use cases, right? For payments, for example, and others. And so that's kind of the, the point is, and this is to add to the fact that, like, yeah, the state grows and everything requires validators to continuously expand their hardware, even uh, it just to continue maintaining the network. So, so I think, like, to me, actually, like, past like three, four months have been a really great validation. And then this is not just about Solana Base and other like uh, kind of 
even you know base is a centralized sequencer right it's a single server effectively but even that cannot get chopped with all the transactions that they need to process and so that's kind of an example of just like as soon as you have enough economic activity you're starting to get kind of this flood of transactions trying to capture that and you don't have any way to either isolate it and add that extra capacity for everybody else to to do this right and so the example i like to use is imagine netflix you go to netflix and first of all if the ad, like in the CDO ecosystem, it would ask you to choose which data center you want to watch from, right? Do you want their arbitrary data center or optimism data center, uh, a base or, you know, a blast? And then when you go there, it says, like, actually, first of all, you need to bring your money from the other data center where you have your money uh, if you want to pay for this movie, or pay for watching the movie here. And then second one is actually, you know, because somebody else watches a, mo- a very popular movie, you cannot watch this movie right now at the lower price you need to pay more so that's kind of the current state right is and what we want to do is you know you go you can pick any movie and you watch it and you pay kind of fixed fee right that like is predictable for everyone and so to do that right similarly how Netflix needs to use Amazon that kind of scales under the hood right and is able to build more data centers kind of ahead of the demand that Netflix has Kind of similarly, you need a network that is able to scale with demand and kind of, you know, in a way, you know, you have the supply demand curves. And so like you want to flatten the supply curve such that even as demand grows, you kind of can maintain the, the fixed fees. Right. So this is the distinction between burst capacity and like average capacity in a sense where like a, a system might only be using like X capacity you know, certain times in a year, but then suddenly like one application or the whole system might require 5X or 10X. And that burst might happen very quickly. And what you're saying is essentially that if the if the scalability properties of a system are only dependent on the underlying machines that the validators use, then that cannot change very quickly to adjust to burst demand. Like suddenly lots of demand comes in. Machines can't be changed across the whole network that fast. So there needs to be like some other mechanism where a burst happens and the system is also able to somehow respond and being ab- and be able to scale uh, dynamically on a, on a shorter shorter time horizon. And this is a, this is a property nearly every blockchain kind of like lacks today, which is why you have gas congestion. Yeah, and so specifically in last months, we went from four shards to six shards, increasing our capacity by fifty percent because we had a couple of applications who had like massive growth. We have Hot, which grew from zero to five million users. It's like over a month, million daily actives <coughs> within a month. And so we started to having this actually congestion without the shards because of that. And so instead of just, okay, everybody's now paying higher fees, your network added more capacity. So, yeah, let's get into what, you know, what, what are the different challenges with, with build it, building a sharded, sharded blockchain? So there's a couple of them. Uh, first of all, um, there are certain uh, changes to the user experience because uh, since nobody maintains the state of all the accounts, if the transaction has to touch multiple accounts, uh, something needs to be done about it, right? And it's a, it's a, it's a very large uh, design space and uh, uh, generally we refer to those transactions as cross shard transactions and uh, uh, that's, uh, that's one big challenge. Uh, the second challenge is uh, in the network in which every node processes every transaction, if you are if you have a node uh, and you are at a particular state, you have very high certainty uh, that every transaction was processed properly because you literally process each and every one of them, right? In the worst case, you can be in a situation where you're looking at the network which is not canonical, right? So maybe some other part of the network believes that the, another set of transactions happened on this one, right? But that's a very different problem from someone literally, you know, like making something that doesn't make any sense according to the rules of the chain. Uh, and so in the sharded chain, because every node only applies a subset of transactions, you need some checks and balances 
uh, which ensure that that what you see is actually a correct state that results from the properly executed transactions. Uh, and when you start digging deep into that problem, into the problem of ensuring that everything is executed correctly, uh, then you you start facing another problem where in order for, like for almost any mechanic you can come up with that ensures that everything is executed correctly, maybe with an exception of ZK proofs. But like once we start digging uh, today, we will, we will see. Uh, you need to be able to access certain information in order to perform the validation. And that information could be uh, made unavailable by malicious actors. And so you need to have a sort of native, you need to have a native mechanic on the blockchain, which ensures that certain pieces of data are available to certain participants uh, and, and cannot be concealed, right? And so those two challenges are like one of the biggest challenges uh, that exist. There are, there are some others. One interesting one would be that because the state is so big, you need to have a way for people to uh, either synchronize state very quickly or work without synchronizing state. So I, I think those four would be the most interesting ones. Right. So like, yeah, essentially, like imagine yourself like being an accountant of the near blockchain. It's a um, it's a massive data structure. You only have a small part of it. The transaction comes. So the first problem is, okay, you might not be able to process the transaction fully yourself because you only have a part of that entire data structure. So you can maybe make some changes to that part, but then the transaction might hit, okay, now it needs to do a change on some other part that you don't have. And that's a completely different accountant. So you need to process you know, some only a, a part of the transaction, and then it needs to be like that. That Rene Beton needs to be kind of handed over to some other party, and then they do that, and and so on. So, like that's that's one that's one issue. Second issue is if you're only handling a part of that data structure, which has contains all the account balances, you receive that data from some place. And then how do you even know that that data is genuine, right? So that's that's the problem of uh, stateless validation or like, how do I know that this data I'm receiving, it's actually processed correctly in the past? And then kind of like, okay, if there's any mechanic to know that uh, any kind of certificate that would tell me that this was processed correctly in the past, then the generators of that certificate kind of need to have had access to that data in the first place. But if that data wasn't there to the generators of like these certificates, then, um, then they won't be able to generate certificates. So certain data needs to be kept in a state where you can reach it in order to do something with it yeah so so a couple of comments so the first one what you ma you mentioned that you need to process part of it and then send it to someone else so it's also important that uh, that message you're sending is not getting lost right uh, it, it has to be delivered with certificates you mentioned that you need to be to have certain data to create certificate it's also in many situations the case that you need certain data to be able to verify the certificate actually like in near in, in one sense, like there's a lot of complexity because fundamentally like kind of like the accountants in your system do not have, may not have access to the full data. And so that leads to a lot of complexity, but in a different sense, near is, um, near is similar to other blockchains in it that it's just one data structure containing accounts and like smart contracts and their data. And this is exactly the same as kind of like Bitcoin and Ethereum, where it's you're dealing in the end with a single data structure. Near is managing the data structure in a different way, but ultimately it's it's a single data structure. Like that's that's a unifying property across all of these systems. Is that right? Yeah. So yeah, you can think of Near as like a very large mapping from account IDs to state, 
Uh, a big difference from other blockchains is that the account ID is not your key. Account ID, you think of it as like a domain name, right? So like, you know, I would be alex.near uh, and it's not just a convenience. It's not just something that is easier to convey to other people. It's also uh, like if, if you think about it, if, if the key is what identifies your account, then if for any reason you have a reason to believe that the key is compromised, your account is gone. Right, you have to create a new one. You have to try to move the assets. Not all the assets are movable, right? Like you can imagine an NFT, which is not movable by design. An NFT, you know, like the first user of this feature, it's an, not a movable NFT. That NFT is gone forever, right? So near, if if I have a reason to believe that my key is compromised, I just change it, right? It also allows you to to do to like uh, auction your account, like like your account has a particular state that you think is of value. You can literally sell your account. There are services on Neo that allow you doing that, right? And then this massive state of mapping, but, but the, at the end of the day, it's still a mapping from an account to, to state, similar to Bitcoin, Ethereum, Stellana, any other blockchain. But that state well, is sharded. Just, just to be clear, not Bitcoin because it takes those, but yes, Ethereum, Solana, every account-based blockchain. But yeah, you know, like UTXO, you can think of it is as even less uh persistent account than than just the key uh, and so this state of all the accounts it's split into multiple subsets right in, into multiple sets so uh today we split by by name right so there would be a contiguous set of accounts uh that lives on shard one and there's a contiguous set of accounts that lives on shard two uh and that those boundaries are not they not immutable through the through the life of the blockchain and as a matter of fact, they did change multiple times. So near launch, it was a single set. Near launch to the single shard, right? And then it was split into four. And then in the recent months, it was split. Two of them were split multi uh, twice into two again. So it's, uh, and in the future, that will be dynamic. In the future, the system will be changing the, the boundaries as the, you know, like as the load changes automatically. So... I mean, maybe one way to imagine it is like um, in your like in the postal system in your city. Most likely, like your city is kind of like divided into these different regions, each with a different postal code, right? Mm -hmm. Where I live, they are called yeah PLZs or something like that. And so each kind of like region of the city will have will have a number, and the city will be partitioned into various different postal codes and you'll have like a post office in every every code essentially and you can imagine like in near it's it's taking that data structure you can think of that as the city and then breaking it down into like these these areas these shards and the dynamism is like if you have like a region in the city that has a postal code and suddenly lots of letters are being sent there and they're like oh now actually we need two post offices, then maybe they will divide the region in the city into into two different regions with two different post offices with two different numbers. And in practice, that does happen, right? Like postal codes change over, over long horizons. And in near, similarly, like, okay, the whole blockchain is broken down into like these shards. And the definition of a shard can also change in order to kind of route around uh, the capacity demand in, in, in some way. If you think of near today, you can think of it as there is a, uh, you know, we all observe what happens in the city and how much mail goes to every post office, right? And at some point we realize that for a particular post office, there is a lot of mail coming in uh, and it's, uh, you know, it's getting harder for the employees there to handle it, right? And so there could be a proposal that says, hey guys, let's build another post office half a mile away uh, and split it like this, right? And then there, there's a separate entity, which is validators of the network, which which either uh, choose to, you know, to go ahead with this change or not. Uh, and if sufficient percentage of them, which I think is 80, uh, you know, wants to go with this change, uh, then it's then it happens, right? And, uh, you know, if you think of near of the future, when dynamic resharding is there, it's slightly different. It's, you know, as mail starts coming into the building, another building just spontaneously pops in without 
without any human being involved, right? It's entirely more, more, like, more like that building splits into two and moves yes, away. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> okay, a new wall appears. Yes, two buildings separate, or <laughs> like on a, on a set of rails, and that happens without any involvement from any uh, natural intelligence, right? Uh, it just it, it just occurs, and then at, at some point, you know, two post offices become you know it's it's getting chill there, so they kind of you know come together Merge and the wall back. disappears. Yes, yes, exactly. But but I think the important parts here, right? As you said, zip codes changes, which means like when you're sending a mail, you you need to like now whoever is in a new zone needs to update everyone. They're like in a new zip code. You know, everybody needs but to like on change. near you never see the zip code. On near you say, I want a mail to be sent to Ilya. Right. And near figures out the zip code itself. You don't need to know it. <clears throat> That's the beauty. Yeah, and, and it, to compare with this with other approaches like subnet, troll ops, etc. I mean in a way they're trying to emulate the same behavior, right? It's like, oh, you know, this this roll up is too busy. Instead of launching there, you know, you can spin up a new roll up. And uh, now everybody can go there and you have more capacity. But it's a very, you know, not just manual and expensive process, right? I mean, like each roll up, you know, cost is uh, at least a million dollars a year just to run between sequencer, explorers, RPCs, et cetera, all the infrastructure. But it's also now every user, every developer, every smart contract of us actually trying to use it now at least to figure out how to go there, how to bridge there, how, what gas tokens is used there, et cetera. Right, so it's it's a huge load on the whole kind of understanding of the network process, which we are actually addressing with chain kind of chain abstraction and chain signatures as well, because we do believe this is kind of a unit like what we try to do with near is a universal problem, right? It's like the capabilities of the network should be able to change dynamically, and everybody should be able to route things uh, without thinking about the underlying infrastructure. But on near, we kind of solved it in a very like direct way by having this kind of namespace that is common for everyone and using that to route uh, kind of transactions and messages mail uh, between between different participants. Yeah, that is so cool. I actually I actually own Meher dot near and and yeah, I've never needed to think about what chart it is on. Right, so to me, I on, I only need Meher dot near, and its journey through time maybe like it was processed in shard number one, then shard number three, and then it's changing, and I never need to know about it. Right, like that's 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 like really yeah. I think it it was on shard yeah shard zero, then shard two, and then shard three. Now it's on probably short three right now, but yeah, you don't, you definitely don't need to know about that. And like, even I am like, you know, there is a way to look it up, but we actually don't show it in Explorer usually because I mean, some new explorers show sometimes, but because we don't actually want people to know because it's, it's irrelevant information. It's like knowing which, which exact computer in, on which rack in AWS is, you know, providing us with this interface we're looking at right now. Yeah, yeah. So maybe like an interesting imagination for Near is because like ultimately it's like this human memorable names at, at the bottom. And maybe, you know, like each human memorable name actually corresponds to a person or a company because th that's how the world is partitioned. And because like the Near system breaks into shards, you can almost imagine like a virtual collection of people that are transacting their business on a shard. Uh, at a certain point and th these are the users of, of the shard itself and of course like as the shard boundaries change the collection of people transacting on a shard is also changing but maybe if we imagine it as like being you know stationary or constant for a certain while which is true for near we can we can think of this like virtual collection of people in the in the near suburb on a sense that's transacting on a shard and then the on the other side, corresponding to a shard, you need kind of servers or validators or postmen in our earlier analogy that are kind of processing the mail that's coming to that particular area or, or, or shard. I guess like one of the questions starts to become, so in any blockchain network, 
you have these validator machines or minor machines that are ultimately like kind of like this postman or accountants of the system that are doing the processing. And even in near, I would imagine, okay, there's a set of validators that are that are found through proof of stake. Now these validators sort of like need to be assigned to shards that hey, you go and process the transactions in in this in this shard, you other one you do it there. And how does that process work? So I, I first want to to correct slightly the first one. I, I think the second analogy was good, but the first analogy was not quite correct because uh, even though uh, shard boundaries do not change as frequently today as they will be at some point, uh, it, it it has been the case from day one on near that two accounts residing on the same shard has absolutely no significance for those two accounts. So I think a better analogy for that would be not a post office, but like a, uh, cell towers. Right, we could be next to each other, and I can call you, uh, and we will be, uh, you know, uh, served by the same cell tower. Or we could be in, in different parts of the world, and I can call you, you know, the different cell towers. But we have no benefit, you know. Like I, I will never know that you're on the same cell tower, uh, and I will never care. Uh, and it is the case on near that uh, if you and I are on the same shard, and I send you money, uh, or I, you know, like we transact on some smart contract, or we, if, if we are in different shards. From the user's perspective, there's no difference in uh, in experience, right? So you know fees are not affected, the performance is not affected, uh, you know, like, like, you know, sharding is completely abstracted to it, right? And so there's no incentive, for example, to try to be on the same shard. There's no incentive to grind, for example, account IDs or like intentionless at the same, you know, account in the same shard. Uh, when it comes to the second analogy, uh, you can think about this way. You can think, uh, I, I like, I like going in multiple steps and effectively saying, you know, let's say we're designing a new blockchain uh, and we want it to be sharded, right? And how do we ensure security when not everybody processes every transaction? And the first idea would be, let's say we have a massive set of validators, right? So we set the, valid you know, the minimum fee to be relatively low. And we say we have hundreds of thousands of validators or even millions, I don't know. Uh, and then every shard even though it has only a subset of validators, it still has a massive set of validators, right? So it's uh, uh, so we have a million total hundred shards, and every shard has ten thousand validators. Then you can say, well, if if we sample them randomly, uh, and we relatively certain that the total set of validators has up to a certain percentage of bad guys, right? We say we believe that the total set has up to twenty five percent bad guys and not more. Right. Then you can do the math and you say, well, if I sample 10,000 of them, uh, then the percentage of the bad guys exceeding 33% is so unlikely uh, that we can consider it to be impossible. Either to do like, you know, one over 10 to the power of some large number. And then you say, well, and because there's no more than 33% of bad guys in the shard, we can just assume that they adhere to the protocol, that any state transition they approve of like if it has, you know, as a particular percentage of signatures of those people who are validating the shard, then we believe that that the transition was valid because the number of bad guys is limited and the good guys signed off. So it's, uh, you know, good to go. It has practical issues. We don't actually have a million of validators uh, and we do want to have more than a hundred charts in, uh, in the limit, but it has a bigger problem, which is the concept of a big guy or a good guy uh, is very abstract. Uh, at the end of the day, everybody who's on the blockchain, you know, they want to make money. Uh, that's the that's the ultimate goal. You know, majority of validators. I'm sure there are some validators who are there to build the you know the decentralized world of the future where everybody's a happy corgi owning their data. Uh, but in reality, majority of them are there because you stake money. Uh, so, or rather, like you have people delegate to you, you, you keep the percentage, you make money, right? And so. Correspondingly, uh, we should think about the security in the presence of the bad guys who will try to corrupt other participants, right? Uh, and people talk. There are ways for people to talk. You know, uh, a lot of validators are just sitting on Telegram, right? And it makes sense for them to be in the same Telegram groups because they, they run into issues. You know, like the network is too slow. The validator, uh, they need to know that they need to upgrade the validator. So they're all in the same Telegram channels. They're all easily reachable. So if the bad guy wants to come and say, Hey guys, I want to do this act of uh, being a bad guy, uh, and I need that percentage of validators to cooperate. Right? I can DM each of you and say, 
This is how much money I'm willing to pay you because there's something for me to gain from the blockchain game going down. It could be some minor extractable value. It could be that I'm, you know, I'm the uh, Solana investor and I just want Nier to go down and Solana to go up, uh, etc. Right. And so the system needs to be designed in such a way that a very large percentage of the validators could be corrupted uh, and, you know, incentivized to do something bad. Uh, and we need to, so correspondingly, let's say we have a hundred or a thousand of validators, uh, and we have on the small sets, a subset of them in every shard, we should expect that almost all of them will get corrupted, right? Or even all of them. Uh, and so the system needs to be designed in a way that, yeah, there are those, you know, postmen in the post offices, uh, but it could be that a bad guy enters the post, post office, gives all of them, you know, thousand dollars and asks them to do something bad, you know, like a route and a mail, which was not actually sent by the originator or something like this. Uh, and so we design systems in a way that that is prevented uh, or made very, very difficult to execute, if that makes sense. So now I don't know the mathematics of it, but if you, if we take that, that scenario that you sketched out first, there's a million validators and then I'm sampling, what I mean by sampling is, is you know, it's a huge set and I'm taking 10,000 and I'm choosing randomly because the blockchain ultimately needs to choose randomly. And then if I get the set of 10,000, my my mathematical intuition says that if it's like 25% of that set of million is 250,000, they are malicious in some way and 750,000 are kind of honest. If I'm choosing 10,000 randomly, my odds of kind of choosing um, a set where the majority, maybe 66%, is malicious means 6,666 are kind of malicious and the rest are good guys. I would think like that would happen pretty frequently, right? Like if I'm if I'm make, if I'm creating these sets like once every second, I would think every six months or every year, I'm going to get a set which is which is full of full of malicious. Now, so if you have if you have 250 out of a million, then even sampling one third. Uh, will never happen. If you sample 10,000 out of a million, then even sampling one third would not happen. Uh, it's extremely unlikely. Oh, it's extremely unlikely. So the so the my 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 physical intuition is wrong. And if I'm sampling 10,000 out of a set of million, and I keep doing that, keep creating new samples. Yeah, you, once you, you can do it like billions of billions of billions of times. Like you can do it every mi nanosecond for a billion years. Uh, and it will not happen. We actually had the math in one of our original papers, right? And it was, I, I don't remember his exact, exact constants, but yeah, it was like 10 to the minus 20 minus 30, something like that, uh, probability. So like lo longer than universe exists kind of thing. But to an extent it doesn't matter because we still, uh, like if your intuition was correct, or if my math was wrong, which is possible, it would only make the situation worse, right? But we're saying, we're saying, hey, let's say the math is such that, and, and, and I think it is, right? Let, let's say the math is such that it's very unlikely to sample uh, a large percentage of bad guys. It still doesn't matter because good guys can become bad guys when they sufficiently incentivize to be bad guys. Uh, and uh, and then in the world of blockchain, incentives are often such that uh, you can you can benefit a lot. Uh, by uh, by corrupting, you know, a set of validators, and so you you would every now and then the validators will choose to do will choose to do so, right? And so correspondingly, you want to design a system where even if the set of validators in the shard is corrupted, right, either either due to sampling uh, or because they were corrupted, what we call adaptively, right? So after the fact, uh, then the system still operates reliably, and and so there are multiple, you know, there are many ways of ensuring that. Uh, and it's, it's the area of research that has been developing. And this is where in sharding, we, we use, you know, this is the, the biggest user of ZK proofs in sharding, because, you know, if I can just prove that my transition is correct, then the problem is solved, right? Instead of sending a bunch of validators, if you can just have a proof that says everything is correct, then it's, uh, and the problem is solved. But maybe building, building this up from the, from bottom up, right? Uh, I mean, it. It starts with so kind of we discussed right. There's there's account space right. 
you know, think of it as a city with people and, you know, we have the cell towers. So when people, you know, call each other, like for, for, for ease of the, uh, of the analogy, when people call each other in the city, right, uh, kind of it bounces to the cell tower and then goes to another cell tower to uh, kind of connect them. And so, so the first thing that we need to do, right, is to ensure that every second, every transaction is recorded, right, and ordered and kind of across all shards and that no, there's no way even for, if everybody is corrupted in that shard to be able to kind of change that order. And and for other use cases also, you know, potentially introduce something that's not uh, valid. Right? And so that's called data availability problem. So Near had kind of data availability from uh, from 2019, then we designed Nightshade. Uh, and then, you know, as other approaches like rollups, et cetera, started becoming more popular, they also needed data availability. And that's kind of where uh, a lot of the current data availability offerings are uh, coming to market. Well, like a, ve- a very short primer would be, you know, like l- let's use rollups as an example, right? So there's a, let's say there's hypothetical optimism uh, and they, they do transactions, uh, but they do not use zero knowledge proofs, right? I actually don't know if optimism is planning to use zero knowledge proofs, right? Uh, and so correspondingly- We're using zero knowledge proofs for fraud proofs. I see. Interesting. Interesting. And so they check in the, you know, the, the, the state route to Ethereum every now and then. Um, uh, and they say, you know, I applied all the transactions correctly. And if you think I did not, I posted just enough of cryptographic uh, information of like, you know, attestation that, uh, that if I did something wrong, you would be able to come and prove that it was wrong. Right. And if you do that, I will, I, I will lose a lot of money. And so I have a strong incentive not to do so. Right. And so, and so then you observe the, uh, the rollup and you see that some transaction was applied incorrectly. You can go to Ethereum and say, this is a transaction. It was applied wrong. And this is the proof. Right. But you can only do that if you actually see the transactions. Right. So if the, if the, if the rollup was able to operate in such a way that the validators cannot see the transactions, then the rollup would be snapshotting something, but nobody can prove anything wrong because nobody sees what's happening. It's like, you know, it's a sealed room. Uh, so data availability is effectively this concept of ensuring and proving that the transactions that you claim to apply and the state on, on top of which you claim to apply those transactions are all visible to everybody, right? And and that's something that Nier had from, we were either first or second to have it live. Uh, I, I don't know when, I don't remember when Polkadot launched and whether they had the data availability from day one. Okay, so you have like a shard and then there's a there's a set of validators that are processing transactions in the shard. Let's suppose get an intuition of like this set of, like let's imagine like shard two or whatever. Um, the set of validators that are processing shard two, is it like a static set or does it keep changing uh, changing with time, like dynamically? It's changing with time. So the idea is, and, and so there is like what's right now live and what's been live for uh, for a few years, and also what we launching with status validation. Uh, I'll probably just start with state, about status validation just for for ease of explanation. So, uh, with status validation, there is a two set kind of two roles that the validator can play, and and all of this is uh, repeatable. One one role is so called chunk producer, which is somewhat similar to what you in rollups called sequencers. Right, so this is the node that receives the transaction, uh, orders it in the block in the chunk in our case, uh, for, responsible for their shard. Uh, it sends out this chunk to others as well, and then executes the transactions and receives the kind of the result. Uh, and so, importantly, kind of where comes in the data availability when. When the chunk producer sends out the the chunk the information, they include they kind of so called erasure code it, uh, which means they replicate this information in such a way that you know they send it to other cell towers, uh, such that even if everybody who's in you know servicing this cell tower 
is offline, goes malicious, etc. Other cell towers can completely replicate everything that happened in the cell tower. So that's kind of what data availability or issue coding is. So there's a chunk producer. Now there's a small set of chunk chunk producers, kind of uh, similar how you know there's single sequencer usually on rollups, but uh, you don't want that because of censorship and reliability. Now for validators, actually you have a different story, right? So what Alex mentioned, you have this adaptive corruption problem, right? So if you have validators which are sitting there for a long term, for a long time, it's it's possible that you go and say like, hey, if you're in this shard and I see you in this shard, for example, or, uh, I can bribe you to you know do something for the shard. And so, and then you need fraud proofs, and fraud proofs are complicated and uh, kind of require additional timelines. And so, with the status validation, we say actually the chunk producer not just produces kind of the transactions but also includes all of the state required to execute these transactions. And so that's so-called state witness. And so then any other node in, this, in the network, right, can receive this block and execute it without knowing anything else about the network except uh, kind of like client of the, of the network. So you receive everything kind of you need to validate that if you apply these transactions, and you have the state, and the state was included in the previous block, then the result is this, and you can confirm that and kind of send the confirmation. And so that's kind of, I mean, in a way, it's, uh, you know, kind of status validation is the ability for any node to come in and say, like, hey, I'm ready to validate. I don't need to syn- synchronize the network state. I don't need to maintain the state in on my disk, right? Uh, which, again, reduces the needs for the validator uh, node requirements, uh, they can just like make sure that everything's okay. And so now you can rotate this validators who validate what chart all the time, every block. They can be actually, you know, you can randomly select a set of validators. Uh, they can be overlapping. You can select, you know, out of the million, you can select, you know, 100,000 per shard and they will validate 10 shards, for example, each if, if there's enough capacity uh, or, or any kind of parameters. Um, and they are able to validate this because they don't need to sync into the shard. They don't need to process every single transaction that ever hit that shard. They only need to look at this specific block. So that kind of opens up a lot, you know, bo- both kind of, you know, you can imagine, I'm, I'm actually really excited that potentially, you know, not probably this year, but soon enough, somebody can open up a new tab you know, type in a URL which has kind of a validator node in uh, in a browser and actually start receiving blocks and validating them. Right? Because again, like you don't actually need anything else and, and browsers have WebAssembly to execute the, the transactions um, embedded. So that's kind of the like very, very light, lightweight uh, validation that you can rotate all the time. So... Like I'm imagining this state witness is as more like, so let's say like there was block N and then the transaction came in and the chunk producer made N plus one. But is it the case that for every transaction, almost like the, for every transaction that they processed in, in that block, they are creating individual witnesses for each transaction. So if you take transaction one, They'll say, okay, transaction one modifies these two accounts. These two accounts had this balance previously. After the modification, the result is these two accounts have this balance now. So our, our state witness is this was what was before this transaction was processed. This was after the transaction process, but the data that's being supplied is only those two accounts that are hit by the transaction. And so for every transaction, you are just creating like these um, like these breadcrumbs, this bare minimum amount of info that is needed to kind of validate that transaction. And that's the state witness for that transaction. So every transaction that comes in the block of the shard by this, this chunk producer entity is kind of broken down into these individually verifiable pieces. And then those individually verifiable pieces are scattered across all of the validators of the shard and they can kind of 
do the job of verifying these individual pieces one by one. And because each of these pieces can be in, uh, verified individually, you that's why you are able to run the validator in your browser because while your browser may not be a powerful machine, it can still validate a few of them. Yeah, yeah, that's that's right. So, is it the case that this chunk producer that's kind of like more a more long lived role, and then the validators of a shard is like a more short lived role, meaning as a validator, I'm doing some verification in this shard, then few seconds later in a different shard, then a third few seconds later in a different shard like that. I'm constantly switching as a validator, but as a chunk producer, when few seconds later is a little bit is a little bit insulting. We produce a block every second, but <laughs> yeah, it's like okay. every second, every block you can be yeah. <laughs> valid in a different shard because there is actually no difference. Like you actually you don't actually care which shard it's on because for you it is just a block result. Like a set of transactions with all the information you need. And so that's why you can rotate validators now every second. Uh, I mean, there's like networking requirements and some, you know, data information propagation. But in principle, yes, it can it can rotate every second. And then for chunk producers, they rotate every epoch right now, which is twelve hours or twelve to fourteen hours. Uh, and there, where you, because you need to actually sync the state, like if you're moving to the next shard. For well, the chunk producer, you actually need to know everybody's balances, right? And so you need to actually download all that, make sure it's correct, consistent. And then kind of while you're downloading, you actually need to now receive new blocks and apply them as well. And so you're kind of doing two jobs in parallel. You're validating, you're kind of chunk producing the shard you're in now, and you're getting ready to produce shard uh, that you are be in next time. And so that requires kind of a more sophisticated setup. Right. So, okay. So then you have these validators that are constantly jumping from shard to shard, validating some small pieces. And when, is it the case that like when I'm validating a certain piece, I'm also adding my signature saying, yes, I checked it and it's correct. And every transaction and its its witness is kind of getting more and more signatures or attestations from the validators and that's how you're building up trust but it's not accumulating over time all the signatures happen on the same block right so so every block you need to do a sign off uh and it's not it's not the case that everybody signs off every block right uh we, we just need a certain majority uh and you know well because blocks are created every every second and the validators are running on a relatively commodity hardware sometimes you will miss a signature and like if you go to an explorer, you will see that like nobody has a hundred percent uptime. People have like ninety nine percent, right? But yeah, but the idea is that yeah, that there's a set of validators. They're validating a particular block. We know whom we expect to sign off on the block, and then uh, you know a majority, a percentage of them signs off, and the block is created. You can look at it and say, well, that many validators signed off. At this point, I know which shards they were supposed to validate. I know that. Unless someone corrupted them in 0.1 milliseconds, you know, it's uh, there's a relatively high certainty that the state transition is valid. Right. Because on the other side, the mathematics says that when I'm sampling these validators randomly, my odds of getting a completely bad set of validators, if 25% of the set in the bigger network is corrupt, is kind of low. So because of, of that sampling, you're able to kind of trust that, okay, while these validators are considered, or you're sampling them constantly, like every second you are changing the samples, but because the prob you calculate the probability of one sample being, being malicious, like 66% extent or something, as being very low, you are able to trust kind of like the signatures on the witnesses of your transactions and be be sure of the state of of a particular shard and meanwhile like these chunk producers when they are producing these blocks they are also forwarding the data corresponding to these blocks to a set of validators now these this this other set of validators may be different from the validators that are uh, checking the witness the witnesses of the transactions right they don't need to be the same set 
And so yeah, so th- so there's two things that happen. One is you, I mean, the the validators that are receiving to check the witnesses, they actually received the data as well, right? Because they actually can validate the transaction. But also, you want to send to other shards as well in case you know this whole shard has failed. But also, like just uh, you want to route the in- outgoing messages, and so we actually combine the message routing data availability and consensus into kind of one process where let's say you have, you know, let's say like you withdrew money from my account on shard one, and then you're sending money to Alex within shard two. So now there's a message going to shard two saying, you know, you should debit Alex, uh, you know, 10 years. And so now that message it's not just a message, it also includes a so-called uh, erasure coded part of the transaction data that this shard uh, was producing. And so kind of this process ensures a few things. One is everybody, you know, then goes and when they actually signing and confirming their own information and, and sending the, their approval, they also confirm they received the needed chunks uh, the needed kind of parts from other shards. And so that's also provides us guarantees with this message delivery from uh, from shard to shard. It provides the data availability guarantees and it's all kind of, you know, integrated into the consensus messages that are being sent by validators uh, to each other to actually accumulate the BFT consensus. So, so it's worth mentioning that there's an extra role called block producers. Right? So there's an actual, is the blockchain is the near blockchain. So it's not like, because often when people think of sharding and, and you know, many sharding blockchains do work this way, people think of multiple chains, right? So every shard is a chain. It is not the case on near. On near, there's only one blockchain uh, and, and there are block producers creating blocks on the chain. Uh, and uh, when, but but those blocks do not contain the actual transactions, right? Or, or, or like logically they do, right? Like you can think of a block uh, exactly the same way uh, as you would think of a block on Ethereum, where it has like a header, consensus information, uh, and a bunch of transactions, with the difference that while logically transactions are there, physically it only contains information about what we call chunks, so one chunk per shard, or rather up to one chunk per shard. And physically, the block does not contain those transactions, it just contains the information about the chunks that were produced. right? And at every particular block, some shards might might miss a chunk. Right, because there's a particular chunk producer responsible at every particular moment. It could be offline, it could be, you know, uh, busy, etc. And so the, a chunk could be could could be missed, right? Uh, but if the chunk is produced, what happens is that the chunk producer, when they produce a chunk, uh, as Ilya mentioned, they erasure code it and they send a part of it to every block producer, right? Uh, and the block producer would only sign off on the block if they have a part of the chunk. That that uh, that is intended for them, and so this is where consensus and data availability are sort of uh, uh, mended together. Is that you know in order to reach a consensus on the block, two thirds of all the block producers weighted by stake have to sign off on it, right? It's a BFT consensus. So if there is no two thirds of signatures, the block, you know, we wait until we have, right? We we favor safety over liveness, uh, and correspondingly, if we cannot get two thirds of signatures, we will stall, right? But we uh, uh, and if you have two thirds of signatures, because the block producer would only sign off on the block if they have their part of every chunk in that block, right? Then you know that two thirds of the block producers have, for every chunk included, have their little part. Uh, and the erasure, erasure code is such that you need one third uh, to reconstruct any chunk, right? So as long as you believe that no more than one third of the block producers is malicious, and if you have two thirds of signatures, in the worst case, all the malicious actors are included in those two thirds. So you have one third malicious, but you still have one third honest. And so you, c- you can reconstruct any chunk, right? So every chunk is available to everybody, guaranteed, if you have consensus reached on the block. So data availability and consensus are merged together into a single single mechanic. Right, so like this is wicked cool. And it's also like hard to understand because this is actually unlike any other system where data availability and consensus are usually like, like two very separate processes. Like 
whether you go from like Ethereum to Celestia to all of the, but in near, it's almost a, yeah. So it's in essence, right? You you want to, it, it sort of uh, uh, begins with with the uh, your goals, right? And then and then we were going back, right? So the goal was uh, to have cross chain transactions and generally uh, communication to be with a delay of one block, right? So if I effectively, if in a particular block a transaction initiated and it wants to do something in another shard, we want that to happen with a very high probability in exactly the next block, right? Uh, and so if the data availability was separate from consensus, that would be extremely hard to ensure, right? Because we need to be certain that data is available as of the moment when the block is produced, as opposed to that being a separate process, right? And similarly, Ilya mentioned there are three things which are merged together, right? Data availability consensus uh, and the message passing, right? So together, uh, the chunk that is now totally available at the moment of consensus being reached also contains the messages that needs to be routed to, the, to another shard. Uh, and it is designed in such a way that it is ensured uh, that by the time the chunk producer of that other shard is producing the chunk, they not only know that the messages exist, but they also have them. Right, and so they can immediately act upon it, and moreover, they have to act upon them. Right, so a chunk producer, the chunk would not be valid uh, if the chunk producer did not act on the messages that were sent from another shard. It could be that they don't act upon them immediately because they, because of congestion. Like imagine everybody sending receipts to the same shard. Right, so that is automatically handled. Right, it could be that the receipt is not processed immediately, uh, but the receipt is acknowledged immediately and it's put on the queue immediately, and most of the time it is also acted upon immediately because congestion is, uh, you know, most of the time there is no congestion, right? But it is all part of the same process where we ensure that uh, if something happens in block N uh, and that something wants something else to happen in another shard, that something else will very likely happen in, in N plus one. And maybe to, to use like uh, Ethereum and rollups analogy here that, you know, you have optimism producing a block. Right, that block immediately sent to Ethereum validators who include it, and uh, as well as they include every other role. Let's say we have our Optimism Arbitrum trying to to send money directly between each other. Right, so like both of the, their blocks need to be included at the same time immediately in the same Ethereum block. Right, to guarantee data availability, because now uh, the kind of our like our, let's say optimism sends something to arbitrary uh, can act on it. But if it's just that, right, then arbitrary needs to read out the state from from the Ethereum, right, which adds extra latency. And so what happens here is you assume that optimism and arbitrary are those sequences are also validators in the network. And so you send them, you kind of optimism arbitrum send their blocks to each other, right? They confirm it. And kind of those sort of stations are now allowed to progress forward the blockchain. And so like as if all the rollups themselves form the Ethereum consensus, right? And we're sending information to each other directly. And in turn, that allows to optimize for latency and for kind of cr this cross-shot communication uh, because everybody talking to each other directly and but rely but then you know sending confirmation to the to the whole united system. So I'll I'll try to state this in kind of you know, my own understanding of how it works. So so it's like we need two different views. One is kind of like the shard view. And then one we need like like the global view because there's a global block. So, you know, we, we went to the shard view pretty well. It's like there's a huge set of validators. Some of them are assigned to the shard for for a block, and then, then we reassign to other shards and they are kind of like validating the parts of the transactions in the shard. Now these validators, some sometimes they also get the responsibility of being these chunk producers, which are more like long lasting entities for 12 hours. For a particular shard, they are they are producing like okay for this block, this is the uh, set of transactions, and here are all of the witnesses witnesses for it. So these are like long lasting entities. So you could have like a short lasting role, and then you could also get a long lasting role as a as a, as a validator, right? 
so that's kind of like the local view of the shard now in the network there's like a global view where there is actually a single blockchain with like block after block after block like like bitcoin or ethereum but what that block contains is not the transactions themselves but the chunks from the different shards that are sort of accepted post consensus as being correct like okay so the, here's block n it contains chunk chunk 1 from this shard like chunk x from this shard chunk y from that shard chunk z from that shard and so on and it just contains what chunks the networks is is considering like finalized and so all of the validators are trying to build this blockchain that just contains contains chunks and the validators are kind of like signing off on that on that block containing chunks they are trying to add their signatures to it and their logic is something like what they are checking is corresponding to each of the chunks that are part of the block did i get the the slice of data uh in order to ensure data availability for the whole network so as a validator when i'm signing off on a block what i'm checking is okay this block contains these chunks if it contains these chunks i should have received the data corresponding to these chunks do i have it in my hard drive yes okay so that's one sort of validation passed and then i sign and like all of the other validators are signing that so fundamentally the network is coming to agreement that we have the data that we are going to need to reconstruct any part of the actual transactions in the block in the future that's the thing people are coming to consensus so in a in a normal like bitcoin like that the when a block gets finalized the network comes to consensus about this transactions that are processed in near when a block gets finalized the network is coming to consensus about the validators collectively agreeing that they all have the data needed to reconstruct every part of the block should the need ever arise is that right is that intuition right and they also like in the world of stateless validation they also have the information that each of those parts were reconstructed and validated by uh, by a set of validators right right not only that the uh, the that the data is there that can reconstruct everything in every transaction in the chunks but also the data corresponding to that every transaction with its state witnesses was validated by a certain number of validators of the shards where the state witnesses originated So it's coming to consensus about data whatever that's yeah that's really interesting um it's really cool yeah i mean the, the big the big benefit was and, and i mean i we do get this question which is like you know why ethereum uh kind of shifted from sharding to roll up architecture and i mean first of all obviously not talking for anybody individually or ethereum or ethereum is not an agent themselves either um but practically speaking to design something like this right you need to build everything from ground up you see how consensus data availability message passing and uh, kind of validation correctness all layered in into one system and that requires kind of this like approach and as well as the vm itself right because vm now needs to be aware that compared to ethereum EVM where everything is kind of available right you can always say like hey give me a state of that other account like tell me how much tokens does you know Alex have in in the case of the sharded system like that requires a cross shard message right that requires say like well go find where Alex lives right and you know and ask him how much tokens he has and so you need to design kind of everything from scratch from bottom up with this understanding given the goal we had which is like you know ultimate horizontal scaling that is hidden from the users and developers in many cases and so for ethereum like they they can do, do not have such a luxury right they have a working system extremely valuable extremely uh, kind of integrated everywhere 
And so they needed something that is kind of an evolution of their existing uh, system versus a complete rebuild right from scratch. And I mean, roll-up architecture, you know, we use it as an analogy because a lot of it is similar, right? Ethereum provides data availability and consensus. Rollups are able to communicate with each other, but they need to go through Ethereum pretty much to kind of validate and, and settle before a message can be passed. And so a lot of it is kind of spiritually the same. It's just because of the kind of legacy of like, well, now each VM is a whole separate universe of accounts, right? And so now you, I am as a user have account on every chain, right? I don't have a singular balance now that I can use everywhere. Like all of that is kind of a legacy. Uh, you know, how do we kind of upgrade the existing system into more scalable platform? So that's kind of really the, the biggest, obviously, uh, you know, in a way benefit we had, which was like starting from scratch and kind of designing it. Uh, with this in the mind. luxury of the clean slate. Yeah. Luxury of the clean slate is uh, it's what you had. Right. Right. So as a validator, sometimes I am taking on this role of being a long-lived chunk producer for 12 hours in a particular shard. I am constantly taking the role of validating the state witnesses of a shard and I'm being assigned from shard to shard to shard. And then every time a kind of like a block is produced in the global main network, what I'm signing off on is corresponding to that block, I should have received some data to back up the data of the state of the entire network, the data of the entire network, I should have received some small chunk of it. I can identify it. Have I received it? And then I sh not only should I ha have received data, but I should have also validated some of the witnesses in the global network or in the shard. Have I done that? And if I've done that, I sign off. And if a majority signs off, that is when Nier says, okay, we have consensus over all that the data is backed up properly and all parts of the update had witnesses and they were validated by enough enough um, enough validators and therefore like this block is correct and like then that's done and then the chain moves on yes yeah that's right and at the end of the day all of that complexity boils down to you know like there's, there are checks and balances that people do but at the end of the day all you care about as the observer is do I have signatures from the sufficient set of validators? And if I do, I know that uh, they have done all the work, or at least they claim to, to have done so, right? But that's but that's a whole set of validators, right? So for them to be corrupted, you need you, you, know, you need to corrupt a uh, like a whole big proof of stake system, which uh, you know yeah, it has sort its own you know de design. There are certain design principles that don't allow it to be corrupted without a massive amount of money being lost. Uh, and yeah, and so that allows also, you know, other chains to easily create light clients, right? So so near itself encompasses a lot of processing internally. It could also be a part of a bigger ecosystem because building a light client for near is a relatively straightforward process. And near having, you know, general purpose WASM machine can can run any light client for any blockchain that allows a light client and that allows you to have. Uh, two directional bridges that effectively say as long as the light client of both chains is not compromised and light clients are very hard to compromise despite the term light client like you know compromising an ethereum light client or near light client is extremely hard right and so then you say well for as long as those are not corrupted near is also part of the bigger ecosystem of, of more chains so i guess like every creator when they make something, they end up having like there's usually certain element of the system that they wished was better. And then do you have those? Like what what for you individually, what parts of Nier are kind of, you're kind of unsatisfied about in the design? Well, I mean there's few things that we're still finishing up or like and, and still on the road, right? I think so we mentioned dynamic resharding, right? So right now as Alex mentioned, right, this is more of a kind of a governance, technical governance process. But the benefit with the stateless validation approach is that because we rotate validators, you know, every second now, you can actually change the number of shards for validators very quickly, right? 
because they, they, again, they don't really care how many shards in the network. They don't care which shard they They just receive the block. And so the benefit here, if we have sufficient kind of redundancy on chunk producers, we can split the chunk producer group and say like, you know, as of next block, you don't care about half of the shard that you were in, right? So comparative, you know, to, to where we are now, where we need to like, everybody agrees, you know, new client has been run, validators spit it up, you know, reshotting happens. This can happen literally instantly where everything's like, okay, now we split into two shards, you know, now I'm ignoring just half of the transactions that I may still receive because people are still routing to me and I'm just processing this half. And then on the junk produce, production side and then on the validator side, you know, now you're just assigning, yeah, sampling, just from a different for, for, for the listener, this is the cell tower splitting into two dynamically or the post office splitting into two. Exactly. Yeah. The- and as it can happen like immediately, right? Uh, which is, you know, huge, huge uh, benefit for the spike in usage where, you know, some application just went, you know, viral, NFT and or, you know, token claim or whatever. And you can like, hey, let's just pull it out into a separate shard, let it, you know, go nuts and then maybe merge it back uh, in like a day or so. So that that's that's you know a definitely huge kind of benefit that and and for context I mean status validation is something we published um, in February uh, and I mean been building last year and uh, should be launching within the next uh, few months and then we're gonna start working on dynamic resharding. Now, from my perspective, there is a uh, few few things that uh, beyond that uh, that would be that we should be working on. One is, and, and Alex actually worked on some designs for this earlier, is uh, uh, leaderless uh, chunk production. So right now, there's one chunk producer at a time that is responsible for producing chunk, right? And I mean, they kind of rotate and they randomly assign, but still, uh, you know, if that chunk producer is offline, now we have a gap on that time slot and, you know, you drop in TPS, you have, you know, higher latency with the users. And so the idea definitely is oh, how they, do they we... Can also be, they can also be GDOS. Which is, uh, yeah, something that happens on other networks like out. No, no, not because we're somehow resilient to that. It's just bad guys shows another network to, to GDOS, not ours, but it can happen eventually, right? So, so leaderless chunk production and consensus is something we need to implement. Uh, and, and we have a, a, a pretty clear way of achieving it. So leader, by leaderless chunk production, so when you say that term, I'm kind of like reminded of Algorand, where where the the essential idea is like when you think of a network, like like you, when you think of like a Cosmos network, the blockchain's rolling along, and blocks have been produced. Everybody knows who should be producing block n plus one, right? It's publicly known, and if they fail to produce, the network waits and then realizes fails to produce. And then the network also knows if that per guy fails to produce the block, then this other guy should produce the block. And there's kind of like a, a almost a line, a queue made of like who has rights to produce. And so that's probably what you mean when you were saying leader. So if you have a shard, you have a multiple validate, like uh, multiple chunk producers, but which one exactly produces the chunk for this block? It's currently known in near, just like Cosmos. But what you would like is a system where there are n chunk producers, and then when a certain block rolls along, one of the chunk producer realizes they have some kind of winning lottery ticket and they can produce the chunk. So this is no, this is not. So you're explaining Algorand, uh, and it is not leader. I'm explaining right? Algorand. So is 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 that the vision for lead? No, there's still a leader in what you explain. So the only difference is that the leader is not known in advance, right? So it partially solves the problem. It's much harder to DDoS, for example. You cannot DDoS someone you don't know, right? And so by exactly. the time yes. you know that they won the lottery ticket, uh, and we actually do uh, the the way we think of it uh, is similar. So in Algorand, you actually don't know in advance that you want a lottery ticket. You you know, like, like effectively what happens is that everybody looks at their lottery ticket and sees the number, and the highest number wins, but you don't know if you have the highest number because you don't know the numbers of others. If you did and others did, 
then it would be no different from Cosmos. Then everybody would know, right? So instead you say, well, I have a sufficiently high number for me to believe that I might be the winner. So I will produce the block. I will publish it. Maybe someone else will publish. And, you know, given my number was 97 out of 100, uh, there's a good chance that I was the highest, right? But maybe there was 98. The, this approach has, has a minor problem that still multiple blocks will have to be broadcast, right? Because, well, like effectively, either the threshold is too high that every now and then nobody will broadcast a block because nobody won the ticket above a certain threshold, or it's like sufficiently low that multiple blocks will, will be broadcast. Uh, but, in our, but in our case, something interesting to think about is that at the end of the day, the chunk will be broadcast to everybody, like a little part of it, right? Uh, and so everybody will have to receive. But within the network, within the uh, within the set of the chunk producers, what they can do, they will have to send the chunk in its entirety for validation, or like with with the validators of the of the shard, right? So you can think of a system where, on the high level, what happens is that every single chunk producer generates a chunk, not just some people who who are beyond certain threshold. Everybody produces a chunk, and then everybody sends to every person in the shard, so like to every chunk producer, every, uh, you know, like uh, erasure coded part. And so at the end of the day, the network overhead is not chunk size times number of participants. It's still proportional to the chunk size, right? But uh, but now every but now you have as many chunks as you have chunk producers, and then you still do the lottery ticket, then you reveal your lottery ticket, and if you want, your chunk is, is accepted, right? But there's no issue with the, uh, choosing the threshold and maybe spamming the network with multiple chunks that have to be exchanged in its entirety. So that's the high-level idea, right? But the high-level idea is that now you can literally never a chunk will be skipped, uh, no matter how, you know, like as long as like, there's one person you didn't DDoS, the chunk will not be skipped. And it's, uh, uh, it's a slightly, slight, slight improvement over an algorithm idea where you, you know, have a threshold and, uh, but still exchange the whole block. Yeah, this is really this is really fascinating. So, I think the essence of the design being that in Bitcoin or in Ethereum, when when I have a block, I have to forward that entire block to everybody, and there's a certain like diameter of the network. So I'm a validator, and there's some validator to which I have the worst connection. Like I, there's multiple hops. And that entire block must be now sent across the diameter of the other side to that worst other validator. But in near almost, it's like I have a more efficient uh, microphone or megaphone. So I produce the block, I cut it into lots of pieces, and I only have need to send these small pieces to all of the validators. So there's some validator to which I have the worst connection, but I only have to send a small piece to through that worst connection, through that diameter of the network. And because of that, because because like this this broadcast of is only piece piecewise, and this broadcast is kind of like efficient, you can afford to have a design where in a shard, all of the chunk producers produce a block, they broadcast their pieces, and like then they compare, okay which of these pieces has some highest amount of randomness and that becomes like the canonical chunk for for that block. Yes, so, yeah, it's going to be a chunk of the block, yeah. And it's like depending, like th that person I have the worst connection to, depending on why they need my block, right? If they're just a block producer and they just need to, to sign off, uh, it's sufficient for them to have just that little piece. They don't need to reconstruct the block if, or a, ch sorry, a chunk. But if they do need the whole chunk, it's still more performing than sending a whole chunk to some, right? Like I send little pieces and then that person will collect little pieces from different entities, right? So it's still a faster way to propagate information. And and I guess the advantage here for us in building that leaderless consensus, sorry, leaderless chunk production is that we already have a concept of this erasure code, right? We already send small pieces. We already have the mechanic to gather them, right? So that's, uh, it's much less invasive change uh, than for a network where today blocks uh, are being sent fully, right? So for them to implement the same feature would be implementing a lot of uh, new mechanics, while in our case, it's just plugging into existing machinery. I, I wanted to touch, so you asked a question, which I think is interesting, and, and Ilya covered it from a very different perspective uh, of uh, sort of 
you know, uh, uh, a something that uh, design wise is not great, uh, and we would like it to be different. I, th I think something uh, I thought a lot from the day we launched near is that the accounting model for sharding is quite different, right? Like you cannot have uh, like flash loans, for example, easily because uh, accounts only give in shards and everything takes a hop, right? And we've been trying to solve this problem. Like we were trying to find a way to have atomic transactions since day one with many different designs. Uh, and it's a drawback of sharding. But what's interesting is that I think slowly we're coming to the realization that long-term not having sharding is not an option, right? So in essence, the highest throughput blockchains today, which are not sharded, are getting congested. And that it's only that much they can squeeze more, right? Like they, they work day and night to remove all the suboptimalities, but at best they will squeeze out another 20%, right? Let's say 50%. That will get congested again. Like the adoption of blockchain today is a fraction of what we want it to be to consider the whole ecosystem to be successful, right? And so sharding will have to happen. And when sharding has to happen, people will have to deal with this disadvantage of, of this different account model. And so Nier in this case is positioned uh, extremely well because from day one, every application on Nier was built with that account model in mind, right? So we have tools, we have understanding. Developers in the ecosystem are used to working in this setup, right? While in the rest of the ecosystem, people are still operating in this uh, atomic transactions mindset, which they will have to abandon eventually. Because at some point, if their application is to scale, and the applications they, de they depend upon are to scale, they will not be able to maintain these atomic guarantees uh, and scale to the usage, right? So they will have to abandon this mindset. Uh, and we're positioned uniquely in the sense that everything that is built on near this, this you know, rich ecosystem of applications is built in a future-proof way. You know, as we create more shards, every application on near gets to take advantage of that. Uh, while for any application that is built on uh, you know, what we call synchronous uh, runtime, they, they, they will have to, to rewrite their applications. I, I think that, that actually the really interesting part is because Near is kind of asynchronous in, in the way every contract, every account and every contract is designed to be independent, it actually doesn't matter if that account is on Near or not. And so that's why kind of a lot of the chain kind of abstraction idea has been coming because well it actually doesn't matter for like for REST finance like an AML on near it doesn't matter if the token is on near or on Ethereum on base on Solana like you can actually deposit any token and the REST finance is will able to handle it and so so like generally speaking near is designed with every like every contract every account is kind of handling assets that are living on like in a synchronous way, right? And obviously it's good to have them on near because you get like one second communication time. So like the latency is very low and you know, the account space is, is nice, but it can be living somewhere else. And if like, if we have kind of a message passing way of sending this, then, you know, near smart contracts know how to deal with that. And all of our standards, like ERC20 analog of standard is designed with callbacks and kind of best passing in mind. And so again, like compared to right now in EVMs, they try to figure out how to do cro like cross layer two communication. The challenges really lies in like all of the standards. Like imagine trying to send their C20 from one chain to another, like there's no standard address space or anything that supports that. It's also synchronous. Like expectation is that that transaction will execute the same block, but actually it needs to, you know, be scheduled, message passed, settled, you know, sent somewhere else, revalidated, et cetera. So, so really that's kind of the, it, it, it was a very non-trivial trade-off, right? And, and we kind of, I would say, had a, had a period of time where we we're like, did we do a right trade-off <laughs> kind of, um, but, but right now, yeah, we seen like, we're literally seeing the validation of our thesis kind of throughout yeah, so the point being like something like flash loan where in the near design, it's hard. It's not that flash, yeah. It's more like Iron Man loan, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's not that flash. So at some point in 2021 or something like that, it must have seemed that, oh, Ethereum has flash loans, but near wouldn't, and that's a problem. 
or is a perceived problem. But when you look at like Ethereum in 2028, which is Ethereum plus all of these L2s and L3s, you can't have flash loans across that entire ecosystem. And you can't have flash loans across near. So it's fine, right? Like it's a it's a downside, but not really. Exactly. Like the modern DeFi of 2028 will be what what people have been building DeFi near for the past uh, two, three years. And as Ilya mentioned, this entire ecosystem of L2s and L3s will also be part of near ecosystem because, because of chain abstraction, right? Any account on any chain can be, you know, with a very thin abstraction layer perceived as a near account just with a higher latency, right? So, so like a near account to near account will be one second always, uh, but near account to optimism account, it's going to be exactly the same protocol on near side. But the latency will be higher because there's uh, communication between them. Yeah, I'm not going to chain abstraction because I feel like we've already covered so much, and I did cover chain abstraction with in the previous episode with Ilya. So, I mean, avoiding that because <laughs> st- things things start to become already too complex. Curious listener can Google near chain abstraction and. Yeah, I just wanted to, to to give an understanding why like like chain abstraction didn't come from it nowhere. Chain abstraction was the mentality we took was near when we designed near. It's just like now we expanded that to kind of all chains, but it's still kind of you know the thinking we put in into designing near is still there. Kind of now, how do we apply it to the whole Web three? Again, assume like you can think of you know, optimism just being another shard of near, and this is where actually like. You know, for example, ZK Proofs it, and Aglair, what Polygon is working on, is all coming together because, like, if we can unify security, right, if we can kind of provide kind of common security layer, then on top of this, you know, and again, we have near DA, we can actually settle DA of other layer twos. Well, now they're actually not that different from other shards of near. I mean, there's differences in sequencing and production. And, so like th- there's things to handle under the hood, but again, we can kind of extend our layer of abstraction that we provide to users and developers to kind of cover up that and say like, actually, you know, if there's decay proofs and data availability, we can actually like say security is the same and now we can message pass and we can do kind of those pieces this way. And so, so that's kind of the idea is like, you know, how do we, how do we apply the same methodology and and kind of user experience, developer experience, but uh, but then expanded back more uh, to the rest of Web3. So, like, from my perspective, uh, you know, when I look at, like, Ethereum, Ethereum's roadmap and then, like, the near and near roadmap, one of the things that stands out to me is in Ethereum, the roadmap is based on, like, sc- scaling via these L2s and L3s. But the relationship between... Ether, the asset, and the core asset of the L2 can be synergistic in at times, but it it can be non-synergistic at other times, right? Like so, so it's like the L2 pays the main Ethereum chain for certain services, and the service intended is usually data availability. But it can be the case that um, the L2 generates 100 million in fees, but it only pays 500,000 in fees to the main chain. It's th- This relationship is kind of like great if the L2 is kind of uh, building a completely new market that Ethereum never had, right? Like imagine, I don't know, some, some AI decentralized app comes and the L2 capitalized on it, built it. Uh, they got 100 million in transaction fees and paid 500,000 to Ethereum main chain. It's great for the Ethereum main chain because there's a new revenue stream coming. It went 500,000, but it's new. The interesting case becomes when some app that was massive, like, that's like massively popular on the Ethereum main chain, generating millions in fees, ends up thinking, it's better I migrate to that L2. And so... They might be making like 10 million in fees on the main chain and then they migrate to the L2 and then the fees get cut to a million and then Ethereum is only making 100,000 on it. So 
So it was making 10 million in fees and now it's only making 100,000 in fees because the L2 ecosystem exists. And they are kind of like the relationship is, well, from the Ethereum, Ether holders perspective, that isn't so ideal, right? Because you're you're losing a dApp that might have been cultivated by the Ethereum network over years and then now it's kind of like migrated away. And in practice, this has happened with something like DYDX. But what's really cool about Near is like this sort of system doesn't exist. Like the shards, like the relationship between like Near and the shards is kind of the Near token kind of like owes the revenues made by all shards. And kind of uh, there is not in order to scale, it doesn't need to have these complex economic games be present uh, between kind of like a main chain and an execution layer, which is very much there in Ethereum. And I believe that this will be this will become a relevant feature of Ethereum's ecosystem politics in the future. And Nia will just not have any of it. Cool. So. Um, yeah, I guess we can we can keep it at that. And it was uh, it was great to have both of you uh, on the podcast. Um, maybe we should have another one to discuss on how Alex is planning to use recent developments in the AI technology uh, and what he's building there. I was going to say that it's not a coincidence that uh, AI stands for Alex Amelia. Yeah, I mean, thank, thanks for having us. So obviously, this is a highly technical topic that uh, I think it's it's been really hard to explain in general. I mean, we've been trying to do this for years now, but the kind of the core idea is also like it was really hard to prove it out when you just launched because when you just launch, you don't have anything, so there's no users, so there's no need for sharding. And I think like we, we've kind of had that problem in Web three where. Everybody was claiming scale, but until you actually have like real world, you know, massive user base to actually transact, you know, just like a, a general improvement uh, was enough. And I think only in last probably like three, six months, we've seen, you know, on Nier, for example, kind of multiple kind of million user applications launching right near right now somewhere between 1.5 to 2 million daily active right which is uh more than uh uh any other blockchain right now we have more transactions usually than all layer two combined at least on some days and so like that that's kind of where this started to prove out right um and uh for context, we're still under Solana transaction numbers, so. <laughs> but, but Solana uh, counts. Solana counts the consensus transactions. So it's. Uh, I, I don't know how we compare to the, to the actual number. Yeah, but but generally speaking, yeah, like we mo we have more uh, daily active users than Solana, and most of the days Tron, uh, because Tron is kind of uh, second the biggest right now, but. Uh, Again, like this, this is a point that, you know, as we started to see kind of this growth, like we started to see, you know, congestions on some of the shards. And the idea was that, you know, we can just expand capacity without increasing fees versus every other blockchain, including Tron actually is a really good exa example because the transaction fees went from being very cheap to actually now being like, you know, 30, 50 cents uh, for their users. Even though they are running, you know, with like a small subset of validators, you know, a a kind of modified in the end uh, chain. So I think like that's kind of where we're starting to see these things play out. And obviously, again, it took a while, right, to ecosystem to mature, the applications to to you know build and launch, as well as for them to gain users. But now uh, we're starting to see this uh, story really playing out, and you know, obviously. Uh, it's it's exciting and it's also kind of tell now is really good time to tell the story and kind of explain how it works. Cool. Then I'll catch you again on Epicenter, Indiana Alex. Thank you. Thank you for being there. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>